Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Jim Davis. I am the chair of the Oregon Disability Commission, and I welcome all of you to the fourth and final of uh, our webinar series where uh, we have been highlighting a number of different uh, disability related topics uh, in celebration of the 30th anniversary of ADA and it's really been great. We've averaged 230 uh, plus people every time and, and, the, and it's really the presentations have been great. I want to um, I want to thank our co-sponsor in this, the Northwest ADA Center. Um, they've uh, certainly had some wonderful uh, presenters that's taken part, and they have been so important in our planning, and, and we just appreciate them greatly, and so appreciate them uh, uh, being a part of, of this effort. Um, the Oregon Disability Commission, um, has been in existence for decades and we emphasize just a wide range of disability issues from uh, access to healthcare to transportation, um, all, all kinds of, of different issues. Employment, we've, we've recently started a coalition around discrimination in employment and we certainly have been very, very involved in the COVID-19 um, issues and involved in coalition work with DRO, uh, which we'll be talking about sure. today. And um, we will, and and so there's, we've done a lot of good things. And and um, and so people are welcome always to come to our meetings. I want to thank Angela Weaver for um, her great efforts in the last two webinars and for being such a great vice chair. and. Um, and for any other commissioners on here, thank you, thank you for being here. Um, I did want to uh, make sure that I have a few housekeeping issues out of the way. The webinar will be uh, recorded and available um, uh, on the uh, ODC, the Oregon Disability Commission, and the Northwest ADA Center's websites with links um, to this website. And, um, at the three dots in the, in the uh, right up top corner is a drop down menu where you can uh, change your name. I think um, I have Uncle Jimmy and Aunt Lois on my name that I have to change. I just remembered that we did a family thing. Um, so I, I'm gonna have to do that one. Um, Cart is available within Zoom um, by clicking on the captioning tab or CC tab or you can click on the link that's provided in the chat box to open a new page. Um, please keep your audio and video off uh, during the presentation. Um, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box and all questions will be answered at the end as time is available. And then of course we ask that you take part in the evaluation poll at the end of the webinar. So anyway, great to have you all here. And let's move on to our session. Um, this is our fourth session and it has an emphasis, an emphasis around the COVID-19 um, problem and, uh, and communication around that. And so we are honored today to um, have a strong involvement in the development of this from uh, Disability Rights Oregon, who we've worked closely with um, on this issue and many, many other issues over the years. They've been doing great work in the COVID-19 effort, and we so appreciate everything that they've done and, um, and that they would come today and, and present. Um, the, the lead today is Emily Cooper, who's the uh, legal director for DRO, Disability Rights Oregon, and has done a wonderful job. Um, along with their, their great executive director, uh, Jay Cornett. And so um, we've asked her to come and lead a, a session and we, we have the honor also of having some, some disability uh, rights activists who um, I will want them all to introduce themselves more fully, but Christine Getman, Cheryl Cis Cisneros, and Gabriella Gardon. 
and I probably massacred your names and I apologize ahead of time. But anyway, thank you all for being here and for developing this wonderful presentation. And I'll now hand it over to Emily. Ah! Hi, um, my name again is Emily Cooper. And actually kicking us off is gonna be Christine Getman, um, who is going to uh, talk to you a little bit about what our presentation is um, and get us going. Hi everyone, um, I'm Christine Getman. I am the executive director of a nonprofit called Magic Wheelchair. We focus on inclusive cosplay and programs for makers. Um, today's presentation is about effective advocacy and how we've had to apply some unique strategies during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as mentioned before, joined by Emily Cooper, ED of Disability Rights Oregon, Gabby Goudon, the Executive Director of the Oregon Self-Advocacy Coalition, and also in my notes, a new homeowner, congratulations, and Cheryl Cisneros, the Executive Director of Creating Opportunities, the Regional Family Network for Marion, Polk, and Yamhill Counties. Advance, if you would like. So I know um, in this series, the first session covered the history of the ADA very, very well. Um, but I just wanted to quickly highlight how the development of the ADA kind of laid the backbone for how we had to advocate during this pandemic. Um, and it's just, I mean, there's no good timing for a pandemic, but what perfect timing of the 30 year anniversary to remind us how we got here. Um, as you know, the 504 section of the Rehabilitation Act was a sneaky little piece added in there. It was a great law, but not many people knew about it. Um, there wasn't a lot of promotion, knowledge, press behind it. Um, so, you know, fast forward more than a decade and we get our ADA um, that got great press. People paid attention and it laid the groundwork um, for, for all of our advocacy for 30 years to come. Um, and, and the way that people succeeded in that was telling stories of their experiences and developing relationships. Now, 30 years later, we are here in the COVID era, this pandemic, um, and it's, it's kind of forced us to look back and realize that there's more work to do. You know, we early on, I think it was February, March, we saw some pretty horrific headlines about how things could theoretically affect people with disabilities. Um, and I think our innate reaction was, well, no, the ADA will take care of that. That's what the general population thought. Um, but we quickly, quickly realized that that needed improving, that we had a lot to learn, and that the universal design that we all benefited from with the ADA was needed once again to develop some policies to protect people with disabilities, but also protect those who love them and care for them. Um, and that's where we are today. So we are here to share our lessons learned in this really rapid advocacy of less than three months. Um, and I'd, I'd like to pass it over to Emily. She's gonna cover some more of how each of us were involved in a very historic and monumental achievement that we are still developing. Thanks, Christine. Um, so before um, we talk about um, what's happened over the last three months, I wanted to just pause um, for folks who aren't familiar with my agency, Disability Rights Oregon, I wanted to give a little introduction. Um, we have been in existence since the 1970s, and we have a, a sister organization in every state and territory, and we are led and consist of a majority of advocates with disabilities. In the disability rights community, there's a saying, nothing about us without us. And that is true for this presentation. It's also true for Disability Rights Oregon's board and our staff. And so early on in the pandemic, um, once we started realizing that this virus was not only going to impact our country, but also our state, our board directed um, the agency um, and our advocates, including myself, to make sure that we're devoting time and resources to ensure that the rights of Oregonians with disabilities are also being protected during this pandemic. We know based on 
quote unquote underlying conditions and other disabilities that we are particularly vulnerable just from a medical standpoint. And this is before you even get to stigma and bias. And so we knew early on in March that we needed to start um, paying attention and devoting resources. Um, one of the things we started is a COVID-19 advocacy task force, which Jim is a, a really active part on and we really appreciate that partnership. But there's a broad group of other advocates on that call. Um, and so want to let you know about us. And also, our, I mentioned that there, the federal law sets up a sister organization in every state and territory, but federal law also gives us five clear goals. One, we're supposed to do outreach and monitoring to all people with uh, disabilities in Oregon to let them know about their rights. We also do trainings like this one. We provide advocacy services to individuals and groups of individuals. We also investigate allegations of abuse and neglect. But one of my favorite tools and mandates that we have is how we provide information and referral to both our constituents and their allies. I often say that civil rights are only as important as you know that you have them and you know how to enforce them. Um, also known as legal anarchy, it's making sure that people have the tools and the information they need to effectuate their rights because um, it's hard to sometimes get a hold of me or someone in my office. And so how can we disseminate the information so that it's powerful? So we've long known that this is one of our requirements and little did we know how important this would end up being in this pandemic. Um, but quickly we realized, and this you'll see the date of one of our um, information referral sheets, we call them Know Your Rights. Um, we created one in April and we, mo we modified it in May 12th to let folks know that they still have rights during this pandemic. In particular, they have a right to accommodation. So that, that might mean you need assistive technology, which was last week's presentation. Um, it might also mean that you need a support person. And so early on, we let folks know that hospitals must allow individuals who provide support. Just because that's someone's right and that's the information we shared, we quickly learned that that wasn't being followed by the vast majority of hospitals who understandably were trying to mitigate the risk of spread of COVID-19 and also exposure to COVID-19. But sometimes what we've learned in the disability rights uh, community is there can be protective measures that actually take away rights. And so our challenge was to find that right balance of protective measures that also uphold rights. And so as Christine mentioned, um, that duality of protection and advocacy is something that's been around since the inception of the disability rights movement. Starting with 504 and the ADA, um, what we learned is there is power in numbers um, and there is power within this community. And so this is a photo um, taken of a group of advocates fighting for Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which was the precursor to Americans with Disabilities Act. But I think the nation was frankly surprised um, and our community was activated to see how much attention we were getting. We were no longer in institutions. We were no longer in homes. We were out in the street and we were fighting for our rights. The other thing that um, was really interesting in that um, when you look at the data around this, we are also a powerful um, contingency in terms of legislative or changes in laws. Um, Oregon data is very similar to the national data. Um, this comes from the Centers for Disease Control. We are a quarter of the population, both in our state and nationally. So this means one of every four Oregonians has a disability. One of every four Americans has a disability. That is a powerful group of people. And as a little foreshadowing and the lessons learned, when you have the power of numbers and you have the power of people coming together for collective action, a lot can get done. The other thing I wanted to pause and mention here um, with the George Floyd protests and the Black Lives Matter movement and a lot of um, attention has been focused on looking at um, how communities of color are also impacted, not just by interaction with police, but also during this pandemic. Um, the data from Oregon Health Association shows 
that communities of color, people with disabilities, and older adults have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And this photo that I'm showing you is actually um, some of the great leaders in the disability rights movement from the 70s, again, pulling together to do the 504 sit-in in Berkeley. And then and now, we recognize that if you have a disability, you may also have other identities. You may also be queer, you may also be black, you may also be old. You have di we all have different abilities, different ages. We're a diverse group of people, and one of the most powerful things, if you've watched Crip Camp, you'll know this, is during the 504 sit-in, you know, the, the first federal law that protected people with disabilities, the Black Panther showed up and provided food. So we've done this before, and we know how to do it again to have a broad coalition um, to ask for change. So knowing that history and knowing um, our successes um, and our failures, um, we knew that we need to quickly uh, pull together and think about a solution to this global pandemic. This virus that you could be asymptomatic, we didn't really know exactly how it'd be transferred, who would get it. It was a time for fear. And, um, and the, again, the activists um, on this uh, presentation, uh, we, want, we knew to start preparing. Um, but I don't think I, any of us on here, just speaking for myself, I wasn't fully um, prepared uh, for seeing how our state um, would do to protect the rights of some of um, our communities. And so with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to Cheryl, who's going to talk about what it was like from her perspective um, and where we started to galvanize our effort. Thank you, Emily. Uh, my name is Cheryl Cisneros, and I am the parent of a young adult who experiences a disability. And um, as we heard in the news stories and um, we understood the, the extent and the severity of COVID as it was becoming a reality in our local communities and, our, and throughout our state, um, one of my worst fears that literally kept me up at night and literally drove me to some ex extensive panic attacks was what would I do if I couldn't be with our son um, in the hospital. He had had pneumonia a few years earlier. Um, we didn't know if he was going to make it through the night. We stayed with him at ICU for five days, um, fighting alongside his nurses and doctors to keep him alive and um, giving him access to oxygen and communicating for him when he couldn't. And so I knew that our being able to support him had a lot to do with his ability to make it through a COVID experience in the hospital. And um, when I was hearing, starting to hear stories and DRO started getting calls and the DD um, coalition and council started getting calls about people being denied supports, being denied family members who um, were there to be, be a voice and to um, provide supports when they were being denied access of uh, those worst fears were starting to come to the forefront and the reality and we were all scared and, um, we we knew that people could die without being able to fully access their health care um, without being able to have the supports that they needed the people who were familiar to them and um, we all rallied around and jumped into action together to save lives. Um, it, it was terrifying, it still is um, scary. And, um, but we also learned that we weren't alone. The Oregon was one of, of all of the states throughout the nation who were experiencing this, this problem. And we knew we needed to have a fix within our system, within our policies um, at a state level so that we could stop this from happening um, as, it, as it started to happen for families and individuals throughout the state. Um, so what we, I'm just gonna jump forward a little bit to the next slide, is um, what we were able to um, achieve, and I believe, there we go. Um, what we were able to achieve in the end is um, Senate Bill 1606. And basically, um, I'll give you some of the details around that, is that it allows um, a patient with a disability um, at least three support persons 
and allows at least one of those support persons to stay with the person who experiences a disability throughout their um, hospitalization experience from emergency room to admission and throughout. And it also allows them to facilitate their care, both in, in sense of communication, uh, daily living skills, um, decision-making, behavioral health and safety skills, things like that. Um, a little quick story is when my son had a seizure recently, we were at the hospital and they were holding him down and he wasn't doing well with that. And so the doctor said, what can we do to help? I said, leave your hands off immediately. He calmed down, no restraints necessary. So things like that to help with health and safety um, and just the, the dignity of their experience. Um, also, hospitals, um, we were experience, people were experiencing coercion uh, to sign uh, do not resuscitate orders as they were being admitted to hospitals or, or not receiving treatments until they would sign that. Um, as horrible as it sounds, that was happening here in Oregon. And this Senate Bill 1606 uh, prohibits that from continuing um, ever again. So. Uh, people may not be coerced to sign forms that uh, outlined the end of life care, whether it's a do not resuscitate order or whether it's a, a life sustaining measures order, those will no longer be required for people to access care. Um, also, the hospital must allow the person with a disability to have a um, person with them for any end of life discussions that if they wish them to be there. And um, relevant very much to our celebration today of ADA is that um, 1606 doesn't affect um, in any way diminish the amazing and wonderful modifications and accommodations that already exist within the Americans with Disabilities Act. So we're, that really laid the foundation for our advocacy efforts to achieve a further clarification at, in our state. Um, and so uh, what I'm really excited also about is that on Saturday, which is August 1st, um, is the day that hospitals uh, must start informing patients of their um, right to have of all of these rights outlined in, in SB 1606. And it happens to be my birthday. So I'm very excited. It's the best birthday present that I could ask for is that families and patients and their loved ones and care providers will now know that they have access to this vital support in the scariest of days. So I'm very excited about that. And then um, we will uh, move to a, a video. Um, from Sarah Gelser, who will outline some of the, the things that we talked about just a moment ago. Um, but Sarah Gelser is a senator um, from Corvallis. She's one of our state senators. And she had an absolutely instrumental role in making this happen and making it happen as quickly as, as it did. So um, Emily will uh, go ahead and, and play the recording of Sarah Gelser for us. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, I want to tell you a story um, about two young women in their 20s, Ellie and Anna. Ellie is my daughter, and uh, just over a year ago, we were here in session. She was studying abroad in Scotland, and she became very ill. She was in the hospital. We weren't sure what was going on with her, and as you can imagine, I was very worried. I wanted to be with her. I wanted to see her firsthand to know how she was doing. I wanted to keep her comfortable in case she was afraid. Emily, I'm going to ask you to pause for a moment. I believe we may need to change the setting in your um, audio so that people can hear it. And I think it's under share screen. Um, It's under share screen, There's others can access the audio. Did, did you get that? And this is Carrie, guys. I'm just gonna give you the uh, half an hour warning. Um, so as you 
fix that audio issue, uh, we're also going to change our interpreters. Great, perfect timing then. Whenever you're ready, I'm able to figure it out. Or just turn up the volume. A lot of people were noting that they couldn't hear it. So I just wanted to make sure that you. Okay, I'm going to actually um, stop sharing and see if I can work this out. Sorry, folks. Yes, there's a setting when you go to share a video where it'll, there's a box that you can click that says enable sharing for audio, I think. I, I don't know all the words on the box, but there's a couple of boxes you can click that make it better. And I think it's in the share screen box. So if you share screen again, oh, share computer audio. Thank you, um, Mand Mandalina. This is Sheila Hoover. Um, I'm one of the, the Zoom coordinators for, for DHS. Uh, you can also check the um, optimize for video clip and that will help with the video quality. So check both those boxes and you should be good. You're doing well, Emily. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you. Thank you everyone for letting us know. Senator Gelser. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, I want to tell you a story um, about two young women in their 20s, Ellie and Anna. Ellie is my daughter, and uh, just over a year ago, we were here in session, and she was studying abroad in Scotland, and she became very ill. She was in the hospital. We weren't sure what was going on with her, and as you can imagine, I was very worried. I wanted to be with her, I wanted to see her firsthand to know how she was doing, I wanted to keep her comfortable in case she was afraid. What I didn't worry about was whether or not she would be able to push her call button uh, to ask for help. I wasn't worried about whether or not she would be able to understand the papers that were in front of her that she was being asked to sign. I wasn't worried about her ability to be able to describe her symptoms uh, or her ability to be able to follow the directions when she left the hospital by comprehending them. I missed her. I wanted to see her. I was worried, but I was worried about the normal mother things. She was 20. Anna is in a hospital right now in Central Oregon. She's 27. She has uh, developmental disabilities. It, last month, she was taken to the hospital. She was spiking a fever. Uh, she had other symptoms not related to COVID. She was admitted to the hospital and she was unable to have a caregiver or her parent come with her. Over the course of 25 days, Anna was in the hospital by herself. During that time, she endured four different surgeries and a colonoscopy. She was asked to sign papers that she did not understand. She was asked to make decisions that she could not understand. And when her parents would connect in via FaceTime, Anna would be crying and saying that she was scared and she didn't understand why her parents couldn't be there to help her. And because her parents weren't there and she wasn't get, they weren't getting updates, they really couldn't help her understand what she needed to do. Their worries were very different than mine. It wasn't about seeing her, it wasn't about sitting next to her bed, it wasn't about holding her hand, it was about facilitating care. Now, there's another person that we heard from in the debate about Senate Bill 1606. Her name is Christine. Um, she has a physical disability uh, called spinal muscular atrophy too. She got meningitis um, a couple of months ago after the pandemic struck. She went to the hospital. Her body, um, she can move one finger on her body. She was not allowed to have her personal carer with her to help her with basic activities of daily living pushing the button to ask for a nurse, being able to pick up the phone to participate in her own care planning, go to the bathroom, eat. She needed that, she asked for that, and she was told it could not happen. That, again, was not about visiting and comfort and a People magazine. It was about her ability to carry out her activities of daily life. Finally, um, there are so many of these stories, but I just want to tell you one more. My own constituent, last month was taken to the hospital in, in my own community. And he too was spiking fever. 
he had respiratory symptoms. Now he's a man with significant intellectual disability, um, uh, communication disorders, he doesn't speak verbally, and he eats through a G-tube. He also, for the last several years, has had pneumonia recurrently, uh, maybe about once a year, and he always recovers from it. They took him to the hospital, thought he might have COVID, and they would not give him a COVID test. He asked, they asked and asked, and eventually they gave him one, and when that happened, with an earshot, a staff person said, that's a waste of valuable PPE. When he was admitted to the hospital, um, his personal support person was not allowed to go in with him. Uh, he was there by himself, and even though everything about this course was the same as it was every other time, they suggested that he uh, be removed to hospice care, to elect hospice, and stop getting nutrition through his G-tube. When his provider picked him up and took him home, they knew that's not what he wanted, but he was skin and bones. They said you could just see the skin stretched across him. And um, they took him back to normal life and he's fully recovered, he's himself again. In that case, the inability to have somebody there by his side that understood his base level, his needs to communicate for him, put his life at risk. I can tell you these stories from all across the state, and you can look in Olis. We got close to 200, if not more of those, over the course of 72 hours, individually written letters, because this is happening today. In fact, Anna's mom, she now can go in the hospital, but she couldn't call in herself because if she left, she would not be allowed back in. Senate Bill 1606 is designed to address this problem. And I just ask you to keep this in mind when all of the debates um, kind of flare out there. The desperate fear that so many people have, knowing that they are at risk of contracting something that they can't see that could take them, that could put them in this process that doesn't prioritize their lives and that they are unlikely to come out. And that is why those people will not be leaving their homes. Today, the Health Authority uh, released new modeling that, that shows the coronavirus is rising in Oregon. And that creates disproportionate impacts on people with disabilities. And it really goes back to what Christine was talking about. The basic civil rights of people that are aging and with disabilities to have access to life-saving care. Civil rights do not pause because of a pandemic. Civil rights do not stop when you walk into the door of a hospital. Senator Gow. Now we, before we move over to um, Emily, who's going to introduce our next segment, I just wanted to mention that 1606 um, passed unanimously. Um, every legislator who was present that day voted for the passing of this without hesitation. So I just wanted to um, acknowledge that as well. Emily? Great. Thanks, Cheryl. So next up is Christine Getman. Um, she kicked us off at the beginning, but you also heard Senator Gelzer mention her and her story in uh, Senator Gelzer's speech on the floor. Um, so Christine, will you take it away and um, walk us through you know, what we learned around effective advocacy and lessons learned? Yeah, absolutely. Um, not video. We tried to edit her video down. She was so incredible, Senator Gelzer. That was originally a 14 minute testimony. It was really hard to trim any of it out because she she said what needed to be said. She represented our community better than anyone could have. Um, and so through this pandemic, I feel like everything led up to that incredible testimony and the passing of 1606. Um, I think we've, we've covered this tool. One of the, One of the things that we learned early on was getting um, needing to communicate your rights and DRO did a great job at distributing this document and continuing to edit. I think there's even a few more um, since then. Emily, correct me if I'm wrong. Right. Many, if there's a topic of concern surrounding the pandemic, chances are DRO has a document to help you understand your rights and how to use your voice. Um, and advocating for them. Um, I think, is, is there another slide? There we go. So together, um, we learned that passing of 1606 and many other achievements through this very short period of time um, combined the power of these four things, stories, incredible partners, 
numbers, amazing numbers, and heart. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, earlier in the pandemic, we kind of thought all of these horror stories were theoretical. Um, you know, we'd read the headlines and assume, well, that's bad, but that's not gonna happen here. We're in Oregon, like, we're, our numbers are great, we're fine. <laughs> we also assumed that maybe the ADA would just step in, that that law would become relevant and protect everyone. Um, but it became real life, real quick, and the critical care triage horror stories came true. Um, the, some of the rationing came true, and the loss of basic human rights also came true. Um, the ADA, more than anything, gave us permission to speak up, and that's something that I had to continue to remind myself. Um, as mentioned earlier, I was one of the many people who experienced the negative effects of the COVID hospital policies, and I learned that telling and retelling my story and hearing other stories actually gave people strength. Uh, originally, I felt like I was just kind of yelling into the void and complaining, but um, people were listening, and that is evidenced by Senator Gelser's wonderful testimony. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not dredging up many of the details of my experience, but I will say that telling my story, I hope, um, will make it so others don't have to tell a similar story or worse and not be able to share, share their story and their experience. Um, I think we, we learned quickly that lawmakers have to hear it and see it to believe it. And our community rallied very quickly when there was discussion of this legislative concept. And this, this was rapid. For me, it was less than a two week window of development. We started with LC52, and before you know it, we have a bill that has been passed. And the community came together and really painted a picture for our Oregon representatives of what was going on and why we needed them to step in. I also think that this experience reminds all of us and uh, having wonderful partners reminds us to continue having tenacity, keep fighting, don't stop telling your story. It's never old. It might be old to you because you've said it 50 billion times, but there's always a new ear and a new person that this could resonate with and you could affect their trajectory of advocacy moving forward. And I think all of us coming forward to tell our story is why we had such incredible partners in protecting our population and our state. And as any bill would be, we hope we can keep improving and growing. Um, the last thing I want to touch on before we pass over to Gabby was, um, and I mentioned I felt like I was just kind of yelling to avoid and complaining. And, and every step of the way, it, I, I just felt like a broken record. Um, but there was a lot of heart behind this. And, and we hear stories about you know senators and representatives not understanding. And, and I, um, so I gave my, my testimony about my experience for the legislative concept. And I expected, for whatever reason, to be met with a lot of questions about my experience or why was it this or that. And, and it wasn't like that. It was, it was silence. And then the president of the Senate apologized and acknowledged the pain that I went through. And that was moving. And I think from that point on, the pain stopped and the healing started. So I think we will pass it on now to Gabby. Are you available? Yes, I am. I'm right here. Hello. So hello, everyone. I am Gabrielle Dazon. I work for Oregon self Advocacy Coalition. On this page, it was really important for us to show all of these organizations and Lilia because we all work together to fight this battle and we have succeeded so much together. Each of these communities have really made an impact on the future of people with IDD and that one thing I recognize we didn't say is number one is advocate. We shouldn't have had a little logo just say advocate 
no matter if they're family or friends or whoever. Um, but it's really important for us to acknowledge all these different um, organizations and also for us to now also recognize all the people that rallied together like Christine and everybody else who just stood up and said, this is my story. We need to change this so no one else gets hurt. Uh, on to the next slide, please. So there is, it really showed this situation really showed what the ADA was actually created for. We are more powerful than we ever thought were, was possible. There's a lot of us. We all rallied around this pandemic, but also the people that came before us rallied around just justice for all when it comes to disability. When we organize, we definitely get things done. And we also got this law passed as a community and it's thanks to the people that came before us who actually helped create the ADA. And we also were able to quickly connect and mobilize with our, not just our networks, but also the advocates throughout the whole state, no matter what, what age, no matter what ethnicity, no matter where you're coming from, we were all able to say, we need to work together to have a voice. We also were able to pass this around and get so many people because we had the go bulletin and social media, which really helped to get the word out. So even if one person doesn't have it, another person was able to do it. And we'll definitely continue to fight and change the system to actually better people with disabilities, no matter what disability they experience or when they become disabled. We are very strong. We will definitely make more movement forward. And I um, personally have a, a story of, for myself, but also I represent the Oregon Soft Privacy Coalition. And there are a lot of people that were able to tell their stories during this pandemic and also to pass bills as far as the ADA. My story is kind of similar to Christine's, but different in a way. I was actually um, in 2009, I, was, I had the H1N1 and I went to Kaiser and they, they didn't treat me right. They sent me to, to actually OHSU because of my medical condition. And I had a really bad experience where I was on a lot of medication because I had two ear, ear infections and in H1N1 and a, a lot of different uh, infections. And so they weren't listening to me and they were spreading rumors and disrespecting me and making it hard for my mom to come visit me. I'm so excited about the ADA because with the ADA and also the, the specialist, my special metabolic disorder, we were able to advocate to make sure my mom was able to be with me the whole time. Um, it was a very hard time in my life, but again, with my mom knew about the ADA and my rights and knew she, I had a right to have someone in there and she was able to be there next to me. Um, there's a lot of people that have been scared and sad, but we were able to use these type of stories as I just told you. Um, if you would like to hear more about it in the future, I can do it. But um, there's a lot of people's stories that are just like mine. And we were able to actually rally those really quickly and make it so there was not as many, if, if no more deaths that occurred over this situation. And this shows the power of what we can all accomplish as a, a community. We can really push forward to change the system to be able to help people with disabilities. And that at the heart of all this, we're all compelled to save lives during the pandemic, but oh, every day, because we're fighting to move the system forward. Next slide, please. So at this point, um, this is Emily. Um, Cheryl, Gabby, 
Christine and I have walked hopefully you through, you know, the past few months and how we've learned from our predecessors about, you know, how the ADA got passed, why it was important and why it remains important 30 years later. Um, you know, our, our rights um, still need to be advanced and protected, especially in the light of this pandemic. And I just want to say personally to anybody that's on this call that identifies as having a disability and has been scared or feels alone in their fear or, um, you know, is, is just worried like we were all uh, worried. I will tell you one of the most amazing things that has come out of this advocacy is the relationships with the women that are on this call with me. Um, it can be scary when you feel alone, but it can feel actually really validating and powerful when you know you're not alone. And while each of us is unique, sometimes we have a lot in common. And I think Christine, Cheryl, Gabby, and I all have in common that we had sleepless nights. We worried about our lives and the lives of others like us. And instead of letting that fear take over, we stepped up um, and we joined the powerful key partners that were mentioned. We joined other advocates and we had a tremendous leader in Senator Gelzer. And so I just think this is such an important story to be telling on this anniversary because um, the ADA is one of the most valuable tools um, our community has ever been given. And we're still using it to, to keep our rights and make sure we're all safe. Um, and so I think at that, I mean, Cheryl, Christine, Gabby, did you want to add anything else before we jump into questions? Um, the only thing I want to add, Emily, is that you're extremely humble and so very gracious. Um, many of you may not know that Emily received um, most of the uh, calls to action when people were um, being left in the hospital um, without supports. And Emily was the one who called the hospitals um, as families were frantically trying to get access to support their loved one. So I just wanted to publicly thank Emily for the lives that she saved in this period of time. So thank you, Emily. Yeah, I definitely want to echo that. Um, it's heavy. You know, we, we feel fear and, and hurt when we read these stories, and Emily took them head on one after the other. I, we were texting when I was in the hospital, sending her selfies. Um, it just, you know, whenever, whatever it took, she, she found a way to, to support people. And I think the community rallying together and rallying behind her really, um, and we made history. And I know it's, I, I think everyone is being a little too humble right now. There is now a law to protect us in a pandemic. And that's incredible. So good job, guys. I want, to, I want to say thank you to Emily, um, but I, I definitely think that the team effort, Emily was able to give us the strength to move forward and advocate for all of this. She was the one that was taking the stories, and as a lot of you can imagine, it's heartbreaking. And her job was very heartbreaking, but she knew what she needed to do to support our community. I also want to thank all of you who are actually on this video today. You had all had parts in this, no matter what you were doing. We have all worked together to fight forward. We have all done our little part with this pandemic, but also the ADA. Mm -hmm. As long as we can stick together and gain strength from each other, we will definitely move forward and we'll actually increase the life of the future as well as the present. Well, I want to thank, um, this is Jim Davis again with the Disability Commission. I want to thank uh, our presenters for a wonderful panel presentation and, and, and such exciting news about the passage of 1606 and great thanks to DRO and to Emily for her wonderful work and this has just been a great session. And I thank you all for, for just being here and presenting this and giving the opportunity to hear, hear uh, what you guys had to say. Thank you so very much. We have a few minutes left and I'm gonna try to um, maybe get a couple questions in for, for our panelists to answer uh, if they are willing. Um, Commissioner Joanna Wilson, uh, part of the, uh, the uh, 
uh, Oregon Disability Commission. She has a question about businesses who refuse to take their masks down. The employees uh, refuse to take their masks down for the deaf and hard of hearing, and and maybe and refuse written communication and then provide what is a, a very difficult barrier for those that do lip reading to be able to communicate. Can you address some of these kind of communication barriers, please? Sorry, before you answer that, this is Carrie. Can you please stop screen sharing um, so that when we are able to do the poll in a few minutes, we can see it. Thank you so much. This is Emily. I'll answer that question or I'll try. Um, Requests for accommodation under the ADA are all individual, but the, the, the question you raise, I think, is something that the vast majority of the, uh, the deaf and hard of hearing community has been raising. Um, and so, um, similar to what Christine said, we've actually done a Know Your Rights Guide on wearing masks and accommodation that's on our website. Um, what we have been recommending folks to do is if they have businesses they visit or grocery stores, et cetera, that they call ahead and say, I need accommodation. Um, and that could be a number of things. That could be ensuring that all employees have masks on that have the visible um, barrier that you can actually do the lip reading. It could also be grocery pickup. It could also be um, or, you know, ordering online. But what businesses have to do is make reasonable modifications or accommodations. Um, Wearing masks right now, consistent with the executive order, it's finding that balance of where businesses need to comply with the law, but also need to make reasonable modifications so that their services are accessible. And so um, that's why we recommend you know, calling ahead. And I can tell you, my friends that are deaf or hard of hearing, they, all of their businesses know who they are and they've got a, a system set up where they can access services and actually like it better because they don't have to go into the store if they have curbside delivery. And so um, that's an option for everybody. Okay, uh, and I apologize ahead of time for not being able to answer uh, all the questions that have been submitted, but Kayleen Gracie um, asks, which agency is a good one to contact if an employer of a PWD isn't ascribing to safety measures laws relating to COVID, thus putting the employee at greater risk of contracting uh, COVID. Should I direct the employee to reach out to DRO, NWADA, or somewhere else? Both are good. Um, our office and um, Northwest ADA, the other is Bully. That's the statewide organization that it makes sure that employers follow the law, including the ADA. And so, but before you contact each of those, one just general advocacy tip, whether it's accommodations around COVID or accommodations generally, is putting your request in writing because that starts what they call the interactive process where the employer then has to work with you to come up with a reasonable solution. Um, there's information again on our website, but um, those are good referrals. It sounds like that's a very smart self-advocate that asked that question. Thank you so much. Um, from Heather uh, Plurod, uh, Plurod uh, I'm also wondering what somebody should do if a business refuses service when somebody is unable to wear a mask due to a documented disability and further refuses to make any accommodations such as curbside service, earlier hours, et cetera. I'm going to go with those same, um, I think, contacting our office, the Northwest ADA Center. The other, the federal uh, agency that enforces the Americans with Disabilities Act is the Office for Civil Rights. And so sometimes letting businesses know that you're going to elevate this, including to enforcement agencies, um, can help businesses turn things around. Thank you so much. I got most of the, a lot of the questions around mass. Uh, so, um, just I would like folks to, to go to the, the information we posted on our website around masks. Um, I think that it's going to repeat a lot of what I said here, but um, I think that's going to be the most useful. And then if you're not able to get the result from the business after following those tips, then escalating it to bully Northwest ADA Center, our office, the Office of Civil Rights is going to be kind of my pattern response to all the mass questions. 
Okay, well, good, good. And, and another last question here, Jess, Jessica B. Um, I would also love some discussion around masks. I work at a student clinic and have some students requesting accommodation not to wear masks due to respiratory issues. At the same time, other folks with disabilities who are, who are immune compromised and are not comfortable being there with, when others are not wearing masks. So how do we deal with such a, such a difficulty? I mean, just speaking for my agency, um, I have really appreciated the leadership of Jake Cornett. Um, we're, work we're all working remotely. Um, and I think that when businesses can do that, um, I strongly urge you to do it. I mean, I am not immune compromised, but I'm a caretaker for my mom who is. And so, um, you know, I don't want to be in a place where folks aren't wearing masks either, but I also recognize that if you have a respiratory issue or trach, or there are lots of reasons why wearing a mask isn't a good idea for you. Um, but I think it's trying to, the, the, this is the beauty of the ADA is that interactive process and the definition of reasonable is gonna depend on each person and their abilities um, and that interactive process. And I think with new technologies, hopefully some of this will be addressed. I think in particular the masks that are not only transparent, but the transparency is clear enough to actually allow people to read lips um, may help with a lot of this. Thank you so much. Uh, one last thing, there's a questions around um, uh, people asking about uh, caregivers and supportive family members and how they can they now come into uh, hospitals and long-term care facilities and then there's a the questions around can people go into these facilities or hospitals and volunteer their time to support people that that question actually strikes pretty close to home um, I'm here presenting on this bill uh, with these fantastic advocates and my mom's in the hospital and I've been denied the ability to go visit her. Um, and so I'm in the process, I mean, with my privilege and my education and my title and my boss, <laughs> you know, and so our fight isn't over as Gabby said, you know, we're still gonna unfortunately have to push for this and I'm still pushing for this. Um, but that's where, you know, collectively if we come together, I will let everybody on this web meeting know if I'm able to see my mom today, but um, we're still pushing. It's, our, the fight's not fully over. Um, I think what I've tried to do just to continue to TMI share um, is inform people of the law, um, inform people of my ability to be reasonable, whether that's wearing protective, uh, personal protective equipment, taking a test, et cetera, um, that this is going to be based on the facility and having these conversations so that we can come up with um, hopefully reasonable solutions. But yeah, it's, it's a little demoralizing. Um, everyone, this is Anne McQueen. I'm the Research and Policy Integration Manager for Aging and People with Disabilities and um, have been talking to some people about kind of what's going on in terms of long-term care facilities, so nursing homes, assisted living and residential care, and adult foster homes. <clears throat> and last week, um, the, the department, the licensing um, wing of um, APD has been working with um, public health and um, outdoor visits are now being allowed in those facilities that um, have submitted a plan for how they're going to keep people safe during COVID. Not that necessarily people want to have those visits on a hot day like today. Um, we went from too cold to too hot pretty fast. Um, but um, that that's a possibility certainly for people. Um, they do have to still stick with the governor's orders in terms of um, face covering and social distancing and limiting the number of people in a particular setting. Um, there's also what's called a, um, a compassionate clause or a compassionate criteria. So someone who is um, deemed to be in an end of life situation that can mean a lot of things. So we'd encourage you to talk with the facility and, um, you know, and, and make sure that those criteria are met. But um, that allows people to visit someone, you know, who's at the end of their life as well. So I just wanted to let you guys know about that and that, that that's available. Um, but like you've said this whole time, I think communication with the business or the, the facility or whatever it is, is key. And, um, you know, to to talk with Northwest ADA if 
you feel like those rules are not fair, then I think the department is totally willing to look at those things and try to make sure that we're um, allowing for people to, to be able to connect in the safest possible way. Right. Thank you so much for all of this conversation, guys. We are over time and I'd like to get the poll out before everybody leaves. And while the poll is on, we just need a few moments of silence and anybody who wishes to stay and continue some questions and answers are welcome to do that. We could do that for about another five to 10 minutes, but let's just go ahead and do this poll so people who need to leave can go ahead. I'm gonna put it up on the screen now. And, and before, while we're putting it up on the screen, um, before we do this, I did want to just kind of close first. Um, we, we actually need to have silence while the poll is on so people with screen readers can use um, their technology without interruption. So if you could just- And I can close phone. afterwards, is that yes. it? Yes, you can. Okay, thank you. Got 87% of people voted. I'm gonna leave it a few more seconds. Carrie, this is Angela. I sent you a message in the chat about capturing the poll. Yep. I'll take pictures. Okay. Can we we're losing people. Can we have a chance to close? All right. Okay. Go ahead. Great, great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to thank everybody for uh, for coming today. We had 210 people uh, join the webinar, and and I think that that what a what a great uh, group, and we had uh, good good 220 230 average throughout. So a thank you to all of you that that actually attended um, on uh, other occasions. Many of you attended for all four sessions. I want to thank our presenters today. You did an excellent presentation, and I think we learned so much. And to our presenters who have done been presenting throughout the uh, throughout uh, our four week um, series. I also want to thank um, our, our staff uh, for their amazing work, uh, Joseph and Ryan, uh, in helping put this all together, and to the Northwest ADA Center for their incredible support. And then um, also, I want to thank our planning committee, our ADA planning committee, which has done tremendous work in putting this um, webinar together, and then hopefully in the fall, maybe having an ADA celebration. So anyway, thanks to all of you and for our wonderful presentations. And um, hopefully we'll be able to see you soon. Take care to everyone. All right, thank you guys very much. Have a wonderful rest of your week. This was a really great series and I appreciate being part of it. Have a great day, guys.